seeking solutions. Amid historic unemployment claims, the White House debates when to reopen the economy, while lawmakers on Capitol Hill prepare to send a bill to the president to help small businesses and hospitals. Threat from Tehran. The head of Iran's Revolutionary Guard has words of warning for the U.S. Navy. And a conversion story. Pope Francis tells the faithful how Peter found his courage. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, April 23rd, 2020. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight, a sobering new reality, sky-high unemployment with more than 4.4 million Americans applying for jobless benefits just last week. Deep into the pandemic, there are still more questions about where this is heading, including what could happen come this fall. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports remotely. Owen. Tracy, with jobless numbers way up, some places are trying to open up. And here in the season of spring, the White House is preparing for the fall. It's only spring, but later this year. Next fall and, and, and winter, we are going to have two viruses circulating. And so, this plea from the White House. One of the greatest tools we have as we go through the fall, winter season that we're into, is to get the American public to embrace the influenza vaccine. The flu and coronavirus are a double threat, so the focus will be containment. We are building that public health capacity now to make sure that we stay in the containment mode uh, for the upcoming fall and winter uh, season, so we will not need to resort to the kind of mitigation that we had to this spring. President Donald Trump remains optimistic. It may not come back at all. He's talking about a worst-case scenario where you have a big flu and you have some corona. And if it does come back, it's not going to come back. And I've spoken to 10 different people. Not going to be like it was. While that worry remains months away, one is front and center. Job losses. Roughly 26 million people have now filed for jobless aid in the five weeks since the coronavirus outbreak. In Michigan, Dye Tech and Engineering is working with General Motors to help make ventilators. Even though my guys are working and my company is still operating and we might be one of the least affected companies while well, nobody is safe. Economists believe the unemployment rate for April could go as high as 20 percent. Our businesses cannot afford to stay closed long term. I mean, they are hurting so badly right now. The mayor of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, has a plan for reopening carefully and methodically. This area thrives on hospitality and tourism. And we want to make sure we are as safe as possible so that we can welcome our visitors back at the right time. As communities battle back and the months go by, there will be coronavirus in the fall. Still, Dr. Anthony Fauci says the country can carefully open back up following those key guidelines, but blow past those and risk a rebound. Although I know one has the need to leapfrog over things, don't do that. Do it in a measured way. Now, to boost the nation's spirits, it's called Operation America Strong. In the coming weeks, the White House says the Navy Blue Angels will be performing air shows across the country in big cities and the Air Force Thunderbirds as well. And uh, the, the time and date to be determined, but look for that. Look up in the sky, and that should lift your spirits. It's to honor the frontline workers. Tracy? Okay, thank you, Owen. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reporting for us tonight. Now, small business owners have been anxiously awaiting for House lawmakers to pass a roughly $480 billion coronavirus relief package. Business owners say it could mean the difference between surviving and being forced to close. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric? Well, Tracy, lawmakers were so reluctant to travel back to Washington, D.C. for fear of the coronavirus. But today's vote was so important, they say, not just to business owners, but to all Americans. So they headed up to the House floor armed with masks and gloves. As experts call for increased testing and states consider lifting lockdowns, today's bill provides an additional $25 billion for COVID-19 testing. This fourth bill replenishes the crucial help for Main Street businesses and local health care providers while devoting more resources to producing more tests and distributing them more quickly. 
At the heart of this bipartisan bill, $310 billion more for the depleted Paycheck Protection Program to help with payroll and rent. So small and medium-sized businesses forced to stay closed during this pandemic can continue to pay workers. Launched just weeks ago, the program quickly reached its lending limit after approving nearly $1.7 million in loans. Senate Republicans pushed for more aid, but Democrats blocked it. They took a defeat on the floor because the congressional Democrats stuck together. Today, Republicans question the delay. We could have done this funding for small businesses so they could pay their workers two weeks ago. Julia Testa Designs is a flower shop in New York City struggling to stay afloat. As a small business owner, we run the economy. But we are we employ people, we make things move. And to be hung out to dry like this and totally forgotten about, it just it makes us feel makes me feel unappreciative. Now lawmakers say small businesses have hope. When this is all over, I don't believe it will be government that saves us. I believe it will be our small businesses. And this is the fourth relief bill, bringing the total to $2.5 trillion that Congress has provided aid to Americans. That's a very, very large number. You know, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has said that before any other bill is passed, there's going to be lengthy debate. Tracy? Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reporting tonight. Thank you, Eric. Well, the additional emergency funding cannot come soon enough for many hospitals facing increased demands from the COVID-19 pandemic and decreasing revenues. And Catholic hospitals are no exception. Joining me now on Skype is Jim Cifuentes, Senior Vice President for Mission and Community Development at St. Anthony Hospital in Chicago. Jim, welcome to the show. We appreciate it. Thank you, Tracy. I know that St. Anthony's is a small hospital serving the west side and the southwest side of Chicago. How has the coronavirus affected the communities that you serve? We've been really impacted. We're a safety net hospital has been serving these communities for over 125 years. And what we would say is we're one of the hot spots. An example of that would be in the state of Illinois, the positive rate that when they're doing testing is 20%. In our area, it's uh, when we're doing the testing at St. Anthony Hospital, it's close to 55% of the patients that we have are positive. Jim, can you talk about how the hospital has been impacted financially? Incredibly so. Even prior to this, because we're a safety net and we serve the marginalized, we're always looking for resources and making sure that the state of Illinois provides those resources, which is a battle in and of itself. Now we're in the midst of a pandemic. And for example, the first wave of federal money that came in uh, really was minuscule as the amount of money we got. And the reason for that was based for Medicare. We have a population about 17%. So what we've got was a drop in the bucket, so to speak. 60% of our uh, payer is Medicaid. We have a 4% commercial payer mix. And so the monies that are needed for us at this moment are critical in order to be able to not only provide the services to the community, but also to maintain our nursing. One of the challenges we're facing right now, an example would be Chicago opened up the field house to provide uh, care for patients in overflow. Well, what happened is they started to provide uh, incentives to nursing nurses that are double, triple the amount of money that we could never even compete with. And so some of the nurses, for example, we have 15 nurses that left St. Anthony Hospital. 13 of those nurses were ICU patients, and they left because of pay. And so in order for us to continue to serve the community in the way we have with high quality, we need to be able to get the resources allocated to us. And even though we're officially not a hotspot, we're advocating to say that we are because we have a lot of community members that are the essential workers that are working out in the communities and continuing to work. To add to that, those essential workers are coming back home. The spaces that they live are cramped. So when people say, you know, you need to go to a room and kind of keep isolated and quarantined, they don't have that capacity. And thus we have family members that are coming in, two or three brothers and sisters that are infected with the coronavirus. 
Jim, I know you described uh, your hospital as a safety net hospital. Are you at all concerned that the current situation is going to limit your ability to continue care for the populations that you serve, many of whom I know are dealing with underlying conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes making COVID-19 so de deadly? Very much so. Look, we are in a space where we have to battle to get our story out there. We are serving the poor. You would think that they would use us as a motto, and here's why. Many people would think you're a safety net hospital. What kind of quality could happen there? According, and this is uh, CMS data, we are ranked number one in Chicago amongst all hospitals in total hospital performance. So that would say that our quality outcomes, our patient satisfaction, patient experience, and our cost efficiency is number one. Given the population we serve, the reimbursement that we get, which is minimal, and to be able to continue to provide high quality is incredible. So are we concerned? Without a doubt. Are we making sure that we are innovative? We are. Um, we're turning, for example, four of our surgery rooms are now COVID rooms. We have 51, as of today, 51 patients that are either positive or possible positive. For sure, 41 of, the, 41 of them are positive. Well, Jim, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Jim Cifuentes, Senior Vice President for Mission and Community Development at St. Anthony Hospital in Chicago. Thank you, Tracy. No abortions in Arkansas. A federal appeals court has allowed a state order halting elective surgical abortions to go into effect. The measure was put in place to conserve medical resources during the coronavirus pandemic. And you can read more about this story and why the judges made their decision at our sister publication, CatholicNewsAgency.com. Senator Elizabeth Warren says one of her brothers has died from COVID-19. She tweeted today, my oldest brother, Don Reed, died from coronavirus on Tuesday evening. He joined the Air Force at 19 and spent his career in the military, including five and a half years off and on in combat in Vietnam. She goes on to say he was charming and funny a natural leader. Seen here in the center, the brother of the Massachusetts senator had undergone treatment for cancer and was hospitalized for pneumonia in February. He was 86 years old. Coming up, new details in the investigation into the Easter Sunday attacks last year in Sri Lanka. And the war of words escalates between the United States and Iran. The head of Iran's Revolutionary Guard threatens the U.S. Navy. Iran's Revolutionary Guard commander warned that it will target American ships. Last night, President Donald Trump repeated his order to the Navy to destroy any Iranian gunboats that harass U.S. ships. Last week, the U.S. Navy said 11 Revolutionary Guard boats repeatedly came dangerously close to U.S. Navy and Coast Guard ships in the Persian Gulf. A priest in Sri Lanka is calling on the government to fully investigate last year's Easter bombings and says failure amounts to a betrayal of the people. Police made 135 arrests for the bombings on two Catholic churches and a Protestant church. 260 people died and over 500 were wounded. But a priest who presided over several funerals last year says although politicians promised to investigate, they did not follow through. Yesterday, Italy passed a record high of 3,000 COVID-19 recoveries in one day. According to the Italian Ministry of Health, Italy has been on a three-day consecutive decline in cases. On Tuesday, the Italian Prime Minister said the easing of lockdown restrictions scheduled for May 3rd would be gradual. Joining us now is Dr. Andrea Cambrieri, medical director at the Gemelli University Hospital. It's one of the main COVID-19 treatment hospitals in Rome. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. Can you give us an update on how the doctors and the nurses, as well as the patients, are doing right now? Now we are getting better, but at first it was really hard. When we, had, when we were attacked by the virus, the virus, 
and we had to react to counterattack and to convert uh, the entire capacity of our hospital, which is a big hospital, 1,500 beds, into a, an infectious disease hospital, uh, mostly. Uh, we had uh, approximately one-third of the hospital occupied by uh, patients uh, affected with uh, this virus. And uh, so we had to dedicate uh, operating theaters, uh, machines, uh, trucks, uh, all to this kind of situation. Now we are uh, entering phase two. The country is going to reopen certain activities, exiting from lockdown and uh, reopening shops, uh, circulation and uh, factories. So we will have uh, possible risks uh, and even in the hospital uh, for um, a possible second wave of the virus uh, pandemics. Uh, so we will have to be very cautious, monitor the patients, uh, especially the outpatients when they enter the hospital. Doctor, can you talk about some of the challenges that you've been facing and maybe some of the accomplishments when it comes to fighting this virus? Um, the first uh, challenge was uh, the need to be extremely uh, quick in reacting and counterattack. The conversion of uh, logistic areas of the hospital and procedures in entirely different uh, uh, areas and activities and procedures. We were trained because we had a crisis plan and we also uh, were skilled on pandemic plans, but uh, we didn't expect such an intensity of attack. So uh, the leadership and the logistics and the unity uh, of the staff uh, was uh, fantastic and necessary for dealing with this topic. You mentioned that Italy is getting ready to open back up again. Uh, can you talk about maybe the virus, if it could re maybe so-called retaliate, and if we could live with the virus? If it's going to retaliate, I hope it will be later, uh, the possible second wave in autumn. Uh, in that scenario, we are able to redo what we have already done, uh, although we hope to a limited extent. Uh, the entire uh, hospital network in Italy, in this region, uh, was converted and had to react rapidly. So we are not uh, drawing back, uh, we are just uh, made, uh, putting the system in pause uh, and maintain capacity in order to deal with what we think will be uh, continuously uh, arrival of patients with infectious disease. Do you have any advice for other doctors and healthcare providers who are battling this virus right now? Yes, we are uh, continuously uh, meeting. Uh, we have uh, meets by television or calls with other hospitals colleagues, uh, especially in the north of Italy. We, they were struck uh, with an intensity which is not comparable to the one we faced here. Uh, the system in the north of Italy, in Lombardy, Milan, nearly collapsed. So we had to learn. We had to learn from that experience, we had, we were lucky to have some time between their att being attacked and us. We, in those weeks, one or two weeks, we built up uh, uh, the reaction. Well, doctor, thank you so much for your time and your insight and what you're doing. We appreciate it. Dr. Andrea Cambrieri, medical director at the Gemelli University Hospital. Thank you again. Thank you. And goodbye. Here in the U.S., as COVID-19 has forced the closure of schools around the country, a new survey finds economic disparities in the amount of online instruction received. The Pew Research Center survey finds 51 percent of upper-income parents report their children have received a lot of online instruction, compared to 44 percent of middle-income parents and 38 percent of lower-income parents. All income brackets report receiving some instruction. Tim Garney, senior political columnist, for the Washington Examiner and resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute joins me now by Skype to talk more about this. Tim, welcome to the show. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. I know that you recently took a look at this for the Washington Examiner. How are the current school closures disproportionately affecting lower income students? 
Well, I think those numbers you cited really do drive it home. And there, there's additional numbers suggesting that um, parents do feel that their children are being left behind. Uh, that's increasingly felt, again, the further down you go on the income scale. And so the, the causes of that, what I, what I speculate, what seems common sense to me, is, is a few. One is just a lot of people in a lot of schools are relying on the internet, the computer, the apps that you and I are using to communicate now. And if you have two kids and you don't have an up-to-date iPad or you don't have multiple desktops or you don't have an iPhone to spare, it might be much harder to get them in touch. Even the schools that are communicating by email, access to a printer, not something everybody has these days, especially if you're not going into a workplace and you can't go down to a Kinko's. So just the, the technological barrier is one. But I think more important is just the presence of two parents who uh, themselves have a full high school education and are around and present. That's a lot more common people with white collar jobs than either um, people who ha still have essential jobs, more likely to be blue collar worker today. And also a, a sad fact is single mothers are far more likely to be in the working class. Poor mothers are much more likely to not have a father around the house. That makes running the education of your kids very difficult. Yeah, it's definitely a difficult situation all around. 41% uh, of lower income parents surveyed in the study say they're very concerned about their children falling behind in school, and that's really significant. Can you talk about that? Well, yeah, because this isn't something that it's just um, a one-time thing. If you're supposed to be acquiring certain basic math skills in the spring of your eighth grade in preparation for ninth grade, then ninth grade comes along, you might not be caught up. And so imagine two different middle schools feeding into the same high school, and one middle school isn't as good at delivering the curriculum to the parents. Or one middle school, again, more working class has more single mothers who aren't as able to sort of do the supervision. Because what we're doing here, my wife and I, we have six kids. We're not exactly homeschooling, but we're not just sort of hitting print and handing stuff to our kids. There's sort of this in-between where we are like teacher's assistants. That's a difficult role. More education helps, but also having two parents helps. And so again, the, the children, the parents who are relying on school for more of their kids' education, they're afraid that their children are not going to be where they need to be come next school year. Well, Tim, we don't have much time, but I do want to get to this question with you. You know, so much is still in flux about when and how states are going to return to normal activity. How do we make sure this gap doesn't widen for our children? Well, one thing is, I think uh, teachers, principals, school districts need to think about the fact that the, the live connection, having a Zoom class where kids are sort of required to attend, is really a burden on families who might not have one high-speed device per child, and that they have to sort of adapt, think about how different parents have different needs. So this is not an easy job. I'm saying the teachers and the principals are going to have to work harder to adapt to this new environment, to figure out what parents need, give them that, and it'll be a constant learning process. All the old rules, all the old processes are out the window. All right, Tim, thank you right, so Tim. much for coming on. We always appreciate your insight. Tim Carney, senior political columnist for The Washington Examiner, a resident fellow at the American Institute, Enterprise Institute, that is. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Up next, Pope Francis says Jesus is praying for every single one of us. We'll explain. Pope Francis reminds the faithful that Jesus prays for every single one of us. Pero ninguno de nosotros Jesús prega. Jesús es el intercesor. At his daily mass at the Vatican, the Holy Father says these prayers can transform us just as they changed Peter, who went from being weak to becoming courageous and bold. Pope Francis also says knowing our Lord is praying for us should give us more confidence in our dealings with the world. Today is the feast day of St. George. It is also the name day for Pope Francis, who was born Jorge Borgoglia. The Vatican says the Holy Father is celebrated by donating ventilators to Italy, as well as Romania and Spain. 
come un abbraccio proprio da parte del Santo Padre in questa situazione di Cardinal Conrad Krajewski says the gifts are meant to be a sign the faithful should be more ready to give than to receive. He also calls it another act of the Pope's embrace to the entire world in this difficult situation. The Vatican has released a free online prayer book called Strong in the Face of Tribulation. It seeks to help the faithful find assistance from God during the pandemic. The nearly 200-page book includes prayers for the sick. It is available from the Vatican Media webpage. A link can also be found on catholicnewsagency.com. And before we go, reminder, EWTN broadcast Mass throughout the day. Mass airs 8 a.m., noon, and 7 p.m. Eastern. We're also showing the Pope's daily Mass and other special programming throughout the day. We also have Eucharistic adoration from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. on our website, EWTN.com. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We're back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.